Hey, everybody. Welcome back to yet another Journal Club uh, brought to you by Lifespan.io. I'm Dr. Oliver Medvedic here, along with a whole, uh, whole group of folks joining us. Um, and today is a special day, isn't it? Tuesday, T W O S D A Y, right? 2 2022, right? We're not going to have we're not going to have that sort of palindromic date in quite quite a while. I don't know how long, but uh, I don't know if anything special is going to happen on this day. But we are having a journal club, so I guess that makes it special. So, coincidentally, our journal club lies on this day. So, welcome everybody. Um, and we have, as always, a special journal to share with all you folks. So uh, kind of in keeping with the theme that sort of randomly popped up the past couple of journal clubs, we've been looking at technologies that might have applicability to uh, rejuvenation therapies um, and anti-aging uh, therapies, if you will, um, and pro-longevity therapies. Uh, and last time we spoke about CAR T cell therapies, right? So this is a therapeutic approach where you genetically modify T cells to basically hunt down and kill cancer cells. But in that, this case, um, the potential here was that you could modify them and, and they might go after senescent cells. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about a uh, really super powerful technology. Um, and we probably won't be able to drill too deep into this paper because um, in this paper, they, they really... Uh, world around 2012, um, after the publication of uh, Jennifer Doudna's and Emmanuel Carpentier's papers, seminal papers where they modified this bacterial system to edit genes. Um, and this system, um, like other technological platforms, PCR, so on and so forth, has kind of been developed in many iterations. And we'll take a look, um, a bit of a look at one of the iterations uh, that this platform has been developed for uh, in this paper. So let me just quickly share my screen here. Um, and this is, this is the paper we'll be covering, Juna Soka et al. Um, from uh, University of Helsinki. So a number of co-authors on this. And the title of the paper is CRISPR Activation Enables High Fidelity Reprogramming into Human Pluripotent Stem Cells. So, um, I'm going to stop sharing here a little bit. Um, so I won't talk too much about stem cells, except, you know, a lot of you are familiar with them. They're basically cells that have um, at it, are at an earlier differentiation state. So you can re-differentiate them into pretty much any cell type that you want. Um, basically all three categories of cell types um, in, in a metazoan, in a multicellular organism, um, mesoderm, ectoderm, endoderm. Um, and you can derive all sorts of cell types. So in the context of rejuvenation and aging, um, you know, this is, uh, this aspect, yeah, might help to recap, recap briefly on what CRISPR and Yamanaka factors are, correct? So uh, I'll get to that in a moment. And I have slides on CRISPR. <laughs> so we'll recap, we'll, we'll, we'll recap the CRISPR system, right? So, um, so CRISPR is an acronym, it's as much as I hate acronyms, you know, there's acronyms and jargon everywhere. So we need to kind of dive a little bit into that. Uh, but, um, so there's a lot of the technologies that kind of mesh here all together, right? So in order to have a that is that is way upstream, that's basically, um, you know, derived from a zygote and every tissue type is, is, uh, develops. Um, and this stem cell is, um, you know, pretty much as mul as pluripotent as you can possibly get. So every type of cell is, is then derived, right? So reprogramming happens, um, at the moment of conception. So it's been sort of a holy grail for a lot of biologists to see if we can uh, learn how this technique is, you know, how this can be adapted into a technique how nature does it. And um, this has been studied for many decades and fast forward into, I believe, 2006, kind of um, early 2000s, 2006, I think 2010, maybe. Um, Shinya Yamanaka and colleagues published a series of very seminal papers where they identified several factors. 
um, the Yamanaka factors, um, which are abbreviated OSKM. Um, there's OCT and several other factors, KLM too. And, um, and these factors are, uh, well, they're proteins that are, are involved in um, switching on a collection of genes, which then uh, sets off a cascade of events. And, and those events uh, basically lead to uh, reprogramming of a differentiated cell. So if you take a skin cell, for example, from a biopsy from an adult, in theory, you know, it could be an older adult, um, although, you know, uh, the older the cells, the harder it is to perform. Um, but by adding in a combination of these factors, uh, you can push a cell basically backwards in time, if you will, to an earlier differentiated state, um, sort of moving the ball uphill, if you, if you will. And then you can roll the ball back downhill again and have that cell redifferentiate into several different um, cell types, um, pretty much any cell type that you wish. So um, that was a big deal, certainly enough of a big deal to get Yamanaka a Nobel Prize. Um, so people have been looking at utilizing these reprogramming factors um, expressed from plasmids in a number of different cell types. Um, so that's because um, older cells in theory and basically reset the clock if you will and and give them a you know give them another uh, you know series rounds of, of replication and enable them to redifferentiate into cell types and, and in theory regenerate an organ right uh, so you know some cells have been recalcitrant uh, to reprogramming and other cells. And the other issues with Yamanaka factors that the authors in this paper raise uh, is that you can, you, it's, it's not as, um, the reprogramming is, is not as tight. You get a lot of other downstream effects. Uh, when you add these Yamanaka factors, they're transcription factors, um, you know, they can switch on a lot of other genes as well, right? So that leads to the CRISPR techno technology platform. How can we actually uh, adapt CRISPR to specifically switch on uh, genes uh, that, uh, that, that basically, you know, that are impacted by the, by the so-called Yamanaka factors? Uh, so in order to, to know how that's done, uh, we need a kind of a brief um, intro into CRISPR. I'm not sure if I've shared these slides before, but maybe I have. And if I have, well, we can share them again. So let's take a look here. Uh, are slides visible here? Let me see. Let me see if I could. Uh... Oops, hold on a second. Uh, all right, can anybody see slides? It should be two journal covers, science, nature. Okay, yeah, I'd like to do it. Um, let's see, let's see transitions to, hmm, I've got the, oh, here it is. All right, slideshow, move that out of the way. I'm beginning. All right, is that better? See, all right. So this is when, so this is a, these are cover of shots of science and nature when, when the CRISPR um, basically platform, uh, you know, really made the first splash. So very splashy titles here, right? Very catchy, targeted destruction, seek and destroy, right? So in this case, we're not, uh, we're not gonna be seeking to destroy anything. We're, we're going to be uh, switching genes on. So the CRISPR system had to be modified. So what is the CRISPR system? Um, well, first of all, um, just a little bit of background on what's going on inside of a bacterial cell. Um, bacteria, you know, are plagued by viruses, just like we are in pretty much every other organism. And um, a lot of naturally occurring systems are adapted by molecular biologists to be used as technologies. Certainly, the knowledge of DNA replication has enabled us to develop polymerase chain reaction. Um, and that same... naturally occurring uh, 
phenomena, if you will, uh, was adapted into a tool, and that's uh, something called restriction endonucleases, which are enzymes that cut DNA, right? Um, and these are naturally occurring systems that have evolved um, over, you know, tremendous periods of time, hundreds of millions of years, even longer than that, in bacteria to cut up uh, DNA that's been injected from, from phages, which are, you know, classifications of viruses that infect bacteria. So these restriction endonucleases, kind of a cartoon here that looks like a Pac-Man, will recognize a sequence of DNA and they'll cut it and they'll chop up the, the infected, basically the, the foreign DNA that's going in. And their own DNA, the bacterial chromosomal DNA is usually protected um, with various sorts of chemical decorations like methylation. So it won't chop up its own DNA. Um, and if we use the lingo of immunologists, this is referred to as innate immunity, meaning that if the phage has a different sequence of letters, uh, these restriction endonucleases won't recognize it. And if the phages have evolved a different sequence and this hapless bacteria doesn't have that right enzyme, well, you know, so much for the bacteria and the phage gets to replicate and um, bacteria bursts if it's a lytic cycle and the cycle of life or quasi-life in the form of viruses continues, right? Um, so we have an innate immune system too. So we have various enzymes and systems and defenses in our bodies that basically are kind of hardwired in. And if organisms figure out a way around it, then, you know, uh, too bad for us. Well, not quite, because we also have an acquired immune system, uh, which means our body has B cells and T cells, uh, which uh, essentially evolve in our bodies, and they produce um, variation um, at chromosomal locations and generate antibodies and T cell receptors and, and all sorts of other, um, you know, um, combinations of protein. And so uh, then uh, what will happen is that, you know, through this randomization process, uh, some of those cells will actually recognize that sequence and they'll like totally expand. And you now have an acquired immune response, right? That's just immunity in a nutshell. Obviously the details are much, much more vast. Um, so where does that lead us to CRISPR? Well, if you were to ask a biologist, probably around 2009 or 2010, not that long ago, um, you know, do bacteria have acquired immune systems? Well, of course the answer would be no, that's, they don't, they have innate immunity. Um, even to this day, I think, I don't think anyone's proven that, um, other higher organisms such as insects have acquired immune systems. Um, and it would be silly to, to even think about how can a bacteria have an acquired immune system because um, it, in, at least for our, our own bodies, requires ce cells. Our acquired immune system is a cellular uh, response. And bacteria, of course, are unicellular. So how, would it, how on earth would it acquire an immune response and how would it recognize, uh, you know, viruses that it's never seen before and how would it would how would it reprogram its own genome um and it turns out that lo and behold bacteria do have an acquired immune response and they have this system uh that is integrated into the genomes of many bacteria and the I'm sorry the acronym CRISPR stands for clustered um uh, regularly interspersed palindromic repeats. So basically just a whole bunch of repetitive sequences of, of DNA that get copied from a virus. So if a virus infects the bacteria, there are proteins in place that can basically copy this um, viral genome um, into a location, uh, into a bacterial location. And that location basically acts as a, a library or a database, an antiviral library. Um, which is pretty wild. That's exactly what it is. I'm not even using analogies here. It's an antiviral database. And if new viruses, um, so if the virus, you know, so it's kind of an arms race at this point, if the bacteria divide and are able to then make a bit of RNA, based on the viral sequences that are in there. This RNA is utilized in the CRISPR system to essentially uh, target, um, basically to, to target the viral DNA that it originally encoded. And it guides 
So this little bit of RNA is now referred to as a guide RNA. It guides uh, proteins that actually do the cutting. Uh, so this is this blue thing is your Cas9 protein. Um, there's other proteins that chop up the RNA that comes out and get, it gets packaged into this, well, it's called, originally called a tracer RNA, but it's been modified in the Dowden papers to be a single bit of RNA. And, and this uh, composite unit here consisting of an RNA and a protein uh, can then bind to, um, through the uh, interactions of the RNA and the viral DNA, can bind to that uh, viral DNA. And the protein part acts as genetic scissors. It'll basically chop up, chop up the uh, invading uh, microbe and basically um, literally make a double-stranded break. So a cut on either side, right? So that's pretty wild. Um, and that technology is basically evolved um, into what's known as programmable endonucleases. So um, what a programmable endonuclease is, so some more terminology and jargon here. Um, so through the 90s and the, the aughts still to the present, um, I talked about restriction endonucleases and these, those rec recognize sequences and that sequence is hard coded into the enzyme itself. But with programmable endonucleases, you can modify them. You can add different protein subunits and make a novel protein where part of the protein guides the part that does the cutting to a specific sequence. Um, and depending on what's the subdomains from transactivating factors or they're from zinc finger um, zinc finger domains, which are these proteins that bind to genetic elements. But basically, um, this was the technology until CRISPR came about. And it was good, but it took a lot of time to develop these because protein, protein engineering is, um, you know, it's a lot, lot of, well, it might be more science now, now that we have AI systems that supposedly can predict three-dimensional structures of proteins pretty well. Um, but it's still very difficult to engineer a protein from scratch and have it do exactly what you need to do. So, you know, the turnaround would, would have been on the order of months if you wanted to target a novel sequence. If you wanted to bring this whole thing to a new location, you had to start from scratch and redesign everything. So this part that sticks um, is the variable part and this part that cuts is not. So this, and this endonuclease here is called FOC1. If it's brought to any location, designated by these ends, it'll cut, right? So here's the, here's the part where you have to kind of vary. So the simplicity of the Cas9 system is the RNA part, which does the guiding because nucleic acids are really easy to produce chemically. Um, and this Cas9 protein, which acts as that FOC1 endonuclease is basically, you know, um, it's gonna be the same. Uh, so you have the, the only part that you vary is this part that's called either uh, single guide RNA or sometimes just called gRNA, guide RNA, because it guides this whole complex to a particular location. Um, and that's the original iteration of the CRISPR-Cas9 system. So you have this, um, you have this guide RNA, which is fairly short. Um, you have a complex formation with Cas9 and all of this is encoded on plasmids that you basically, um, that you basically insert uh, transform into your cells. And then your uh, guide RNA basically um, forms a heteroduplex at a particular location and brings this whole complex over, right? So if we zoom in a little Cas9, and there's many other Cas proteins. So, you know, this technology has been rapidly, you know, expanding. Um, so the only thing you need to actually modify is this really short region here that's about 20 nucleotides long. So by just modifying these 20 nucleotide regions, um, you can target your, your, CAS, your CRISPR system to pretty much almost any location, right? There's, you know, so that's, that's your variable region. Um, and this is sort of, you know, everything stripped out. This is all the little details you need to know. We're not gonna worry about this PAM site here, but you know, there are constraints you have to worry about when you design the sequence. And, and um, there's, other, there's other CAS systems that basically allow you to recognize other sequences. So you can pretty much get a lot of, you know, almost total coverage of any genome. So that's the cutting. So once this complex forms, 
you have an endonuclease domain on one part of Cas9, another endonuclease domain, and they cut. Um, so how do we reprogram cells? Because this is cutting DNA, right? And we want to switch DNA on. Um, well, like I said, this technology has been kind of, you know, really uh, stretched, you know, past its original iterations. And there, there have been modified variants of Cas9. So keep this in mind. This guide RNA basically guides this blob, this Cas9, to any location, right? And what it originally does is it has these endonuclease domains that cut. Um, what if you genetically modify these endonuclease domains and um, deactivate them so they don't work anymore? And this Cas9 is referred to as a, uh, a D-Cas9, short for dead. So it doesn't, doesn't do it, it doesn't cut, it doesn't do anything. So basically you get this, you get this whole blob um, targeted to a location very precisely. And now the Cas9 doesn't do anything, doesn't cut. Um, so that's not too exciting. Um, but what's interesting is that you could now modify these Cas9s to bring something along to that location. Um, and that's what that's the topic of this paper. So there's another you know, stretch of amino acids that forms an activator. And I believe the activator used in this paper, uh, I wanna say VP106, but it might be a different activator. Um, and what an activator is, it's basically, um, it's a protein that recruits um, RNA polymerases and you know, other elements to um, a location, and it basically switches on transcription. So it switches genes on. So you basically now have a very powerful system where you don't really need to know what the, what the native activator is inside of, inside of a cell. Uh, you can have a, you can just see, you know, um, you know, find out a sequence that's proximal uh, to the start of a particular, you know, messenger RNA sequence proximal to the promoter, have your guide RNA guide this whole system over there um, and the gene will be switched on. So in the context of this paper, they've looked at several genes, um, including you know, locations that express the Yamanaka factors. So you can switch these on uh, very specifically inside, inside of the cell. Um, and there's been many iterations and variations on this system. So this paper, they, they have an activator form of CRISPR-Cas9. Um, you can do the same with repressors, the shutoff genes. You can make a GFP tag variant so you can actually um, see where particular genes are located on the chromosome. Um, and, you know, and you can imagine all sorts of other, other variations on the theme, right? So um, pretty cool. Um, and uh, yeah, any questions? It's quiet out there. People can feel free to unmute themselves. All right. <laughs> Guess that was clear. Okay. It's quiet out there, Oliver. It's almost that too was quiet. Real, that was a real nice introduction. I really liked that. Yeah, it's good. It was good. Because not obviously uh, everybody watching isn't necessarily going to know uh, the ins and outs and what all this jargon means. And, uh, it's a good start. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's, that's the, that's the basis of technology. And, uh, and, and um, yeah, coincidentally, I was, I actually just, just landed in JFK um, like two hours ago. Um, and I was in San Francisco and uh, we were passing mammoth biosciences, which is, if you Google it, it's a, it's a, it's a CRISPR Cas9 company. And I think, I think it was founded by, by Jennifer Doudna, who got the Nobel Prize, or maybe she's on the board of directors. But it, it, so I was just, I noticed Mammoth Biosciences out when we were passing it on the road. I'm like, yeah, what a coincidence. We're doing a CRISPR related paper. We do have a comment now in, uh, yeah. from Facebook. Hello, everybody in Facebook land. Um, Edward, uh, Edward Hudgens, I nearly said Huggins, and Edward Hudgens has uh, commented. I saw last year the use of CRISPR 2.0 to turn off tau proteins in neurons, which could mean potentially turning off uh, Alzheimer's. And he gives a link. Yeah. Thoughts on uh, that, Oliver? 
Yeah, I mean, so so kind of a general comment. I haven't read that paper, um, and of course, when you say turning off tau proteins, um, we have to we have to be careful because tau proteins um, are uh, microtubule associated proteins, and 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 they you know they they play they play also important roles. So I don't know exactly what subset of tau proteins they were targeting. So, um, but without going kind of too far into that direction, um, kind of a more uh, I guess a more mechanistic um, technological um, caveat, I would say, is that is that there's always the issue of delivery, right? So, so these these reprogramming factors that are introduced here are It's going to get into some organs, um, liver, other other organ types. Um, you know, getting, getting this system into every neuron in your brain, in your cortex is, is, is going to be really problematic, right? Because you're basically, you have to, you have to get this, you have to get, uh, at least, uh, several plasmids, uh, transfecting, you know, your cells and, and you've got, you know, you've, you've got, uh, uh, you've got a lot of neurons. What is it about on the order of about a uh, hundred million neurons, a hundred billion neurons, sorry. So, uh, and, and you could get, you know, you could get a nucleation effect that can propagate, you know, in a number of different regions, of your brain, um, potentially leading to Alzheimer's and not, not even getting into the issue of, of, you know, so I'm not even going to touch on, you know, um, how much of a role these tau proteins have in, in kind of, setting off beta amyloid plaques and how much of a role beta amyloid plaques actually play in Alzheimer's, right? Is there's been controversies about that, but assuming they, they do, then we have the issue of, and, and assuming that targeting tau isn't gonna have any other negative downstream effects, uh, the issue is still delivery. How do you get this system past the blood brain barrier and into that many cells? Um, you know, cleanly without triggering any type type of other immune response, right? So, so you know that's that's a challenge. Um, but these but these technologies are you know these challenges are kind of orthologous to one another, meaning that um, the you know switching on or off genes um, you know is now achievable using this technology, um, and now you know um, developing better delivery methods you know is 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 another another kind of series of you know technologies waiting in the wings they use basically uh, these lipid nanoparticles that are the same types of technology that are used in the in the current iteration of SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, vaccines um, but these were targeted lipo nanoparticles um, that I believe they had a receptor that was basically in, in, inserted into their, you know, into their lipid bilayer, and they targeted uh, classes of T cells um, within, uh, within. Well, it wasn't a patient. This was done in mice, but basically targeted in uh, in situ, uh, which is which is different than the CAR T technologies that are used now, which is basically. Um, engineering the T cells in a petri dish and re re reintroducing them back into the patient, right? And and that that adds a lot of expense and cost. Um, but being able to just inject these directly into into somebody's blood and have them reprogram the T cells right there, um, you know, is is a huge um, improvement in efficiency and cost effectiveness. However, getting into blood cells, you know, is pretty direct and easy because you literally inject it into somebody's vein, right? In, in theory, and, and you can target enough um, multipotent stem cells, blood stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells to, to get the job done. Um, but the brain is, is you know, a, a different organ. And, uh, you know, then the issue is, is how do you, how do you do that, right? How do you, how do you modify that? Um, Maybe there could be some workaround. Maybe you can. Maybe we can use a, a, a modified CAR T cell therapy that basically um, targets microglial cells and hyperactivates them to scavenge, you know, um, cells that are over over reproducing um, 
tau proteins and scavenge beta amyloid plaques, right? And these and these microglial cells, um, uh, you know, once they're introduced and get past the blood-brain barrier, they, they basically can seek out and destroy. Um, you know, So free form here, right? This is uh, this might be this might be a way that uh, that plaques and um, and uh, uh, hyperphosphorylated tau, which is the variant that's that's uh, connected to Alzheimer's, um, could be targeted, right? Um, anyway, just some thoughts, right? Um, um, yeah. Great question. You've got another one as well from uh, Chris Rose. Chris Rose is one of our new writers. Hello out there, Chris. I've just sent hey. him an invite, so he might actually be joining us in a minute. Mm -hmm. But he asked uh, on Facebook chat, uh, can you envision a timeline uh, for using CRISPR in vivo? Uh, I know that obviously we've had the uh, Ocampo Belmonte uh experiments uh, david sinclair did some experiments on mice as well with the with the optic nerve that they crushed and then they rejuvenated the eye uh, that was like a couple of years ago mm -hmm. so we have technically used deployed it uh, well yamanaka has technically been deployed hasn't it uh what about crispr um uh, for, for this or any other use really oliver any thoughts on the sort of timelines we're talking about because it's obviously it's a bit of a minefield, isn't it? This gene uh, 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 genetic uh, modification and or whatever you want to call it. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I don't know how they what what sort of um, because again, CRISPR is basically a tool used used to um, you know just through the you know few slides that I showed. It's it's basically a tool used to um, originally to to cut DNA and introduce double stranded breaks at a location. And I didn't go into um, I didn't go into the repair strategies there because if you wanted them actually to, to uh, modify the sequence and, and convert it into whatever sequence you want, but in the in a case of gene therapy, you'd want to revert it into a um, copy off of, and 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 that whole process is called homologous um, homology directed repair. Or homologous recombination, um, and I do believe that there is a patient. Um, so you know, I don't know if they use CRISPR to do this type of gene gene modification. You could use other technologies to do it. So so again, CRISPR is the tool to basically you know target these cells. But you could use other programmable endonuclease. So CRISPR is just you know just in the context of gene therapy. Just keep in mind that CRISPR is a very flexible programmable endonuclease. Um, it isn't the first by any means. They, you know, there've been others that have been around for, for decades, uh, but Talons. it's just- Talons, yeah, fingers. exactly. But the, CRISPR is just the easiest to basically reprogram and target to other locations, right? So, um, so with that in mind, um, there have been gene therapies um, where genes have been modified and very recent ones. And I don't know if they used CRISPR per se, they haven't introduced this into um, in situ to modify cells within the patient's body, but I believe they've actually removed cells, modified them and put them back. Um, the two that most stand out in my mind is um, a patient, it may have been more than one patient now, where they've modified or basically um, interrupted um, a co-recept for HIV CCR5 and introduced uh, those blood cells back, those multipotent um, hematopoietic blood cells back into the patient um, that had HIV. Um, and they, they were effectively cured of HIV because their blood was repopulated with cells that no longer had a co-receptor for the virus to dock onto. Um, so that was a, that was kind of an, so I'm not sure if they use CRISPR in theory, they could have used CRISPR because like I said, it's just basically just cutting the location. So maybe they used tailings or zinc finger, but in theory, they could have used CRISPR. And recently I, I haven't read, I haven't actually looked at the clinical trial, but there was supposedly a patient um, cured or treated of sickle cell anemia, which is basically. Actually, um, I believe it's it's from uh, 
I think one form is changes aspartic acid to, um, uh, to maybe valine to some hydrophobic amino acid, and that causes the, the hemoglobin to clump inside of cells. Um, and when it does that, it elongates the red blood cells into a sickle shape. And, and that morphology, that distended morphology, basically clogs capillaries, right? And then, and then cells, then those cells can't get packed through to particular tissues and those tissues are starved for oxygen and it's very painful and, um, and you know, and in extreme cases can cause death. Um, so I believe that that, um, that patient, uh, I have to look into it, but like I said, I, I haven't read the actual primary article. I, I saw, it, um, saw it in the news, uh, was treated um, with, with uh, you know, um, had, uh, was modified uh, through, this, through, the, through this modification. It could have been CRISPR, so I'm not 100% sure, but in theory, if it wasn't, if, if it was some other endonuclease, uh, modifiable endonuclease, it could have been CRISPR. So, so those are examples that were already, um, you know, already um, achievable, um, at, you know, via CRISPR and, and, and have, you know, and, and individuals have, have been, you know, treated and, and um, with, with this type of therapy. Now, of course, even modifying CAR T cells, you might even, might even be able to use, you know, uh, you know, CRISPR in that, in that respect, because it's just a tool. Now, introducing it directly into a human, um, so you get modifications happening in in situ, I don't think that's that's been done yet. Um, I could be wrong. Um, there was a huge bit of controversy a few years ago um, in China with a researcher who genetically modified human embryos, supposedly, um, basically at the you know at at the ver very early stage of embryogenesis, maybe like the the first cleavage state, or you know, um, basically right right after the zygote. Um, and the modification was to make, you know, uh, I believe he's in, you know, he got into a huge, it was a huge ethical scandal because there's obviously nobody got approval for it. I think he's in jail actually in, in, a, in a prison for a couple of years somewhere. Yeah, China. I think, I think he uh, disappeared or um, he, he went, didn't he get disappeared to a black jail? I don't know. Uh, did, but he it was... even, did he even strangely and suddenly pass away, or was that the person? No, that was the person mm. that blew the whistle on the Wu, uh, the Wuhan uh, in uh, COVID when they found yeah. uh, that yep. he blew Wuhan, the whistle yeah. on that the COVID was yeah. present uh, in Wuhan, not necessarily the origin point, but yep. I believe they mysteriously um, didn't they pass away mysteriously. <laughs> Well, they, um, they, 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 well, they supposedly were infected by, by, uh, you know, they supposedly got COVID, the, you know, and, yeah. uh, and they, and they died, but, uh, but this, but this Serious. case, yeah, but this case with the other researcher, um, pre predates that by, by at least a year or two, maybe, maybe more, um, when they, when they tried to do CRISPR on, yeah, it was, it was a huge thing. It was basically, um, they had editorials in nature and science, basically, you know, all geneticists basically, freaking out but you anyway. know well, that's the difference isn't it i mean <clears throat> that, that 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 the differentiation needs to be see what i did there it needs to be made um between editing uh somatic cells and and stem cells and uh germline cells and yeah. that's what i think people do get uh mixed up and they go rah 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 we shouldn't be uh, doing this it's changing what it means to be human but the, the, obviously the nuance here is no one is proposing that I know of to edit germline cells, which then gets passed to the next uh, generation. That isn't yeah. happening. And I don't think that that's going to happen. Uh, well, I think that's a long way out that. But the somatic cells, maybe, uh, as you say, don't think we're that too far away, are we? Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's definitely happening now. And, and it's a little, a little using CRISPR if you're cutting DNA then there's a, there's an issue of, of, of um, unintentional genetic rearrangements that have been shown to occur upstream of, of certain loci if you if you cut it um, but in this case here in this paper here they, they use the modified CRISPR that doesn't cut DNA so again these are these are um, a dead uh, Cas9 which basically means that um, it's uh, it's enzymatic um, 
you know, roll is, is it's not functional, it's mutated. So it doesn't, doesn't do any cutting and it's been modified to act as an activator, right? So wherever, wherever the guide RNA takes it, that's where it activates. Um, so of course, when you design these guide RNAs, there's software that helps you design it. You have to know, you have to have the, gen, you know, your genomic sequence. You have to make sure that, you know, the, those guide RNAs will guide the system where you want it to go and nowhere, and, and you don't want there to be any non-specific specificity. So clearly you, you want to make sure that that uh, you're not switching on the wrong genes. Um, exactly. Yeah. And it also means no super superhuman uh, superpowers uh, for our children uh, being passed down from us. Not yet anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure like, you know, look, uh, <laughs> uh, we, humanity loves, loves pole, pole vaulting over, 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 uh, over hurdles and over, um, over things that other generations have considered to be taboo. So, um, you know, this is now, I'm not going to predict what's going to take place a hundred years from now. Well, yeah, probably the eugenics wars will begin and someone like Khan, called Khan will rise to power. Khan. Yeah. No? Perhaps. Maybe. Perhaps. Yeah. I, 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 I uh, doubt it. I see Chris has joined us. Uh, Chris is one of our new team members, by the way, Oliver. He's one of our new writers. Hello. Hey, Chris. How are you? Um, I see Stephen Rose. Is that your gnome? Oh, yes. Stephen, yeah, sorry about her. that. He goes by Chris. <laughs> named after my dad. Source of confusion my whole life for people. Sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so... Uh, well, I guess I guess we've got enough of a background to go into the paper. Now, there's there's a lot of figures here, and I'm kind of not prepared to dive into all of them because I'll tell you, uh, I'll give you like a just kind of a heads up. This paper really drills into this technology and to show that it works in reprogramming cells. So, um, so there's not much reprogramming of, you know, there's a lot there's a lot that you know. Basically, this is this is to whet everybody's appetite, right? Because if we can genetically, if we can re reprogram cells using this CRISPR system and basically do in situ Yama, Yamanaka factoring, right? Then, then in in theory, you might we might be able to rejuvenate, you know, a kidney or other organ in situ, right? Um, so, so that's so just want to keep that in mind um, because they don't do that in this paper, by the way, right? They're not, they're not going to be introducing it, unfortunately, in this paper into old, old mice or, or uh, so we're not going to be seeing uh, examples of that. The closest they come to it, though, is that they do re reprogram um, fibroblasts. So they, they look at cells. Um, they, look, they look at several cell types. One cell type is what they refer to as, um, uh, I want to say, um, lymphoblastoid cell lines, but it could be lymphoma cell lines um, and also fibroblasts. And they mentioned that their system here uh, is able, was able to um, genetically reprogram or revert into, um, and this is another key term I, I forgot to mention, induced pluripotent stem cell. When you make these stem cells using these types of reprogramming factors, they're called IPS cells, induced pluripotent stem cells versus stem cells that are naturally derived, right, from, from, from an embryo or, or some other source, right? Yeah, and so, it's worth, uh, I'm just going to interject there, sorry, Oliver. it's worth noting that IPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells, they are something that's really uh, used every day now in medical um, practice, um, because obviously Yamanaka discovered them back in 2006, so they actually are commonly used for stem cell therapies, you know, on a daily basis. It's kind of yeah. cool, right? Yeah, yeah. And and those of you have been basically keeping up with, uh, you know, we uh, like the phrase goes, we live in a we live in a society, man, right? So we have to uh, we have to basically play by play by rules that maybe we all don't agree with. So I remember I remember in grad school it was a huge deal during the. Um, second Bush administration, where um, federal funding was cut to stem cell research because of issues dealing where where embryonic tissue was, you know, basically was derived from, and uh, and of course, and and it's you know uh, you can't underestimate how, how how many scientists were freaking out about this, right? So states started their own funds to basically fund their own stem cell research because all the federal funds from the NIH were cut off. 
uh, you know, you, you know, labs were doing all sorts of Kafka-esque things like, you know, like cells that were, you know, cells that were, 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 um, uh, you know, if, if some, a lab member was working with stem cells that were derived from embryonic tissue, they had to be clearly marked and kept in a different section of the incubator, you know, because God forbid you used a media that was, that you paid for out of federal funds to feed those cells, right? And then you're basically, and then, you know, and so it was just, can't cross those streams at that point, right? So it was, a, it, you know, it just came out of nowhere. And, um, and I think that was also a big driving force for the development of IPS cell technology because people were then really aggressively looking for, um, eventually would have happened anyway. People were, you know, people really wanted to figure out how, I mean, that was always the goal to figure out how to reprogram cells on your own. Um, but, but the Amanaka factors and that paper basically came about in that era. So just to give kind of a context and that may have been a big, huge also societal push that you know, that, that spurred that technology. So. Well, <clears throat> another advantage of IPS over um, fetal stem cells is that they can be from the donor autologist. Exactly, exactly. So that's an excellent point that John raises there. So if you're doing, if you're going to be doing stem cell, that was one, you know, issue. If you're going to be studying, you know, drugs, or you're going to be looking, you know, doing, you know, studying um, development, and then that's, then you could use um, fetal stem cells. But uh, if you're going to be introducing them into patients, you really want a close donor match, right? And that's, and, you know, and you might need to genetically modify those somehow, and, and, and so on and so forth. So making stem cells out of a patient's own tissues, they're autologous, their, their body won't, won't, won't recognize it as a foreign invader. So you can reintroduce those modified uh, those stem cells that you developed from somebody's skin biopsy right back into the patient and you won't have a, a host versus graft disease or, you know, there won't, there won't be, or, uh, you know, so you, the, the, those cells will take, right? So that was, that was also, that's also a huge positive here um, with these uh, IPS cells as, as they're called. Um, There's some controversy over how effective they are in potential relative to Embryonic stem cells, though, right? Like, I mean, you don't you have a lower risk of immune immune you know uh, immune reaction to the cells. But I, I've seen some stuff by Neil Riordan, and I'm not sure if he's you know, all that credible or not. But mm -hmm. he, he showed some research where he was saying the regenerative potential of these other, like umbilical cord cells, for instance, are just dwarf what you get with autologous stem cells, particularly in an older or like middle-aged person. Is that, what do you think about that? Um, short answer is I don't know, but I do know that um, like in this paper here, when they, when they genetically reprogram these cells, they, they compare them to, um, to uh, other stem cells and, and, and look at the gene expression profiles and show Um, I, I always, I kind of mentioned that, you know, if, if, if you're, if you made an induced pluripotent stem cell, how do you know it's an induced pluripotent stem cell? And how, how do you know it's close to another multipotent stem cell that's, that's an adult stem cell and not something a little bit aberrant? And then it gets to the issue of if it quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's probably a duck. And because there's no kind of, I think, overarching 100% theory that you can basically say, well, this is, this is, this is definitely a stem cell. You could probably say that, you know, it's acting 95% like, you know, like a multipotent stem cell. So that's pretty good. And, you know, so basically if it can, if it can originate tissues, you know, that, that are derived from the mesoderm, ectoderm, endoderm, um, if you can put it into mice and get a teratoma, if, if it basically has gene expression profiles that basically match, um, you know, that of other multipotent stem cells, then you say, well, then it's, it's, uh, probably good enough. It's probably, it's, you know, so, so, it, you know, clearly as people study these more and more then that definition is going to get much more refined. Um, and, and, and I think in this paper here, you know, they, they do RNA sequencing of individual cells um, and they 
So, so as, as sequencing technologies get more robust, as the annotations of different you know, subpopulations of some stem cells get better, then, then the matching of, you know, then you can make a, you know, you can make a, a more robust fingerprint, if you will, and match it with the cell that you induced and say, okay, well, that's, that's going to mo most likely be, you know, be correct because it, it, uh, it fits all this whole palette of criteria that we have, you know, from, from a, uh, a reference stem cell that's a naturally occurring stem cell, right? From several donors and, 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 and where it counts, we have all the matches, right? So, and that's kind of what a lot of, a lot of these, a lot of papers do in the induced pluripotent stem cell field. They, they, they do a whole bunch of different matches, um, you know, uh, RNA expression profiles and so on and so forth and match it to other cells and show that you have a, you have a close enough Yeah, that's my on that. And it's probably inevitable is that that map is going to improve, right? So, so that way, when you, when you add in factors, you're not going to, and they, they mentioned this in the paper here, in this paper, and I'll just pull it up that, you know, using some of the, some of the uh, factors they put in there, they, they don't get things that are quite as STEMI. <laughs> You know, they kind of are, are, are you know, or, or they, or they, they're a little bit sluggish to develop into a, a induced pluripotent stem cell. So they basically hit upon a combination of, of factors, which is better than the Yamanaka factors, according to them, um, that gets, gives them a, kind of a, a group of iPS cells that are much more closer to, you know, what a proper stem cell would look like, right? Um, so that's, um, that's what they do here, and that's in this paper. Uh, so again, they have a lot of figures here. It's five figures, um, a lot of subfigures, and I'm going to just make this smaller, I guess. Um, and this uh, figure one here is basically uh, their sort of first proof of concept. Um, CRISPR A, so they call this CRISPR A, um, and they published papers um, prior to this. Uh, CRISPR agent A stands for activator, so that's the activator domain. Um, reprogramming of LCL, and LCL is um, let's see, lymphoblastoma cell lines, I think. Um, lymphoblastoid cell lines, um, which are generated by Epstein Barr transformation of B lymphocytes. Um, and the reason they're using these lymphoblastoid cell lines is that um, it's it's kind of a quick way for them to see if they're basically. Um, becoming transformed and starting their process to become stem cells. So it's kind of a quick, quick and dirty way for them to screen, um, according to them. So they say in vitro LCL cultures grow in suspension, meaning that if you grow these cells uh, in liquid, they kind of ball up into balloons and they float around, right? So they're just basically, um, they live in the blood. So they're going to be, you know, if there's nothing To the culture surface, providing a simple means for the specific enrichment of cells. So that's why they pick these cells. So that's and, and of course, and then they mention another advantage. Uh, you've got a lot of these cells stored in biobank repositories, and you can also basically um, test them on different. Um, you know, you can you can get samples from different people to make sure that there's no what they call donor effect, right? So you don't want you don't want your your technology to only work. In Oliver Medvedic, as much as it would benefit me, it would have no benefit to anybody else. You wanted to, to work on everybody here on this panel and, and more, right? So, so you want to test different cell types to make sure there's nothing funky in, in, in one, one cell type versus another, um, or from one donor versus another, right? Because um, we're all genetically heterogeneous, right? We're not clones. Um, so there could be, could be differences. There certainly are differences, but there could be rele relevant differences too. Um, to this reprogramming technology. Um, so there's a little schematic of what they're doing here. Um, so these OSKML, so these are, these, some, these are basically variations on the Yamanaka factors. And then they have a couple of extra ones um, that they're basically trying out. Um, and this is their picture of the, you know, there's the guide RNA, there's the, you know, blob of Cas9 and all these little little lines here are supposed to be cartoon representations of guide RNAs, right? That basically switch on different factors. 
Um, and this figure A is basically showing in this lymphoblastoid, this was lymphoblastoma, lymphoblastoma cell line that you're getting cells that it's kind of hard to see here. So they're, I guess, floating in culture and here they're squished out and, and form colonies. Uh, and they're in the IPS cell stage. And in between, they're in this mid reprogramming stage, right? Um, and then they look at the efficiencies. And as a positive control, they have uh, a transgenic cell line, which is, I believe, uh, constitutively expressing Yamanaka factors, right? And, uh, and AP colonies per million cells, alkaline phosphatase is an indicator. Um, it gets upregulated in. and senescent cells, it's a useful indicator that they are, um, you know, becoming stem cells. Um, and oh, and here's the activator, DCAS9, VP192. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little um, protein that attracts, um, I believe, binds to um, a poor part of uh, RNA polymerase, um, or it could bind to something else, which in turn binds to RNA polymerase. I'm not 100% sure, but anyway, it recruits RNA polymerase directly or indirectly to the promoter regions of, of basically um, these, um, you know, of, of all of these factors. So these factors are then, you know, not added in externally as they usually are, but they're actually switched on um, within, they're switched on from their native loci using this targeted system. So pretty cool. Um, and what they look at is, so just to kind of unpack the abbreviations, right? So the promoters of, so here are the, here are the OSKM factors, OCT4, also known as POW-SF, SOX2, KLF4, MIC, and LIN28A. Um, and they look at two different ones that I believe in previous publications have shown to um, have a kind of a more efficient effect on, so this is, so we can think about this system now as sort of like Yamanaka factor plus, right? So kind of like, Yamanaka factor 2.0. So they're adding in these extra, um, they're switching on these two extra genes. Um, and then they have these, you know, um, names that are very uh, kind of um, unwieldy. Um, ALU motif or L ALU motif, these are these repetitive sequences. ALU motif enriched near promoter regions of genes expressed during embryo gene activation, EEA motif, embryo genome activation enriched ALU motif. So, you know, just uh, another another uh, gene, let's just say, <laughs> that needs to be switched on. Um, and another locus, which is the miRNA cluster MIR302 slash 367. God, these names are, are really unwieldy. Um, and microRNAs are just a, um, without going too, too far into kind of um, the rabbit hole here, um, that's a whole new field of, in of itself. So uh, genes could be basically switched on, um, you know, at the promoter level, like they, like, you know, we, we're, I've introduced here with activators, right? So you, you target Cas9 that has an activator to a gene region and you switch a gene on and you can also switch a gene on. RNA or other RNA by basically using, there's um, another um, regulatory um, series of steps called microRNAs, which are kind of like, you know, so, you know, we talked about CRISPR and we talked about CRISPR being the guide RNA, guiding the CRISPR system to, or the Cas9 to um, phage DNA and chopping it up, right? So microRNA is kind of like that. It's, 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 it's a system, it's totally different though. It's, it's, it's a diff different enzymes are used. So it's not, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a CRISPR system, but what it is, it's an RNA based system uh, to, uh, in this case, not target DNA, but target RNAs that are, that are transcripts. And once the microRNAs bind to them, they, they can, you know, shut them down through a variety of different pathways. Either, either it recruits other proteins that will um, cleave the DNA like Dicer, or it'll, uh, it can bind to regions where translation occurs. So then proteins aren't made from, from that. So anyway, um, short, long story short is that these are the two new gene regions um, that are targeted um, uh, 
you know, and one of them, the EEA uh, guide RNA is just abbreviated E in the paper, and then the micro RNA cluster MIR-302 slash 367 is just the, is just abbreviated M, right? So, so that's what these letters stand for. Um, so, um, so here is basically their results. Um, they get some, you know, they, they're, 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 first we're trying to, you know, I guess recapitulate some of their earlier work and showing that um, uh, targeting, and these numbers here refer to the number of guide RNAs um, and where they bind, right? So uh, that's just their abbreviations and nomenclature. So GFP guide RNA is a negative control. So that ain't doing anything, no guide RNA, nothing, right? Um, and they, so they get some, they get some modest reprogramming with E5 and here and they have to get at least as good as the transgene. So not quite as yet. Um, so this is, they're basically, um, you know, working on, on, in this figure here on combinations uh, of these factors to show that they might actually initiate reprogramming. Um, so let's see what else they have here. Um, the program efficiency, four so they use four different donors. Um, so E5 averaged 38 colonies. So that's just how many colonies actually were. So again, the efficiency is just the number of colonies they got. Um, uh, so those colonies though were, you know, were true stem cells. And they knew that they were true stem cells because they went through basically the, comparing essentially through, um, to databases, IPSC databases. So CRISPR, A, IPSC. So this is basically a, a comparison of, uh, so figure C validation, um, the blot using bulk mRNA seq data in grouping. Your lymphoblastoid lymphoma cell lines and also fibroblasts. Um, and I think they're, they are using lymphoma cells here and somewhere they use fibroblasts. I think E is fibroblasts. And I think that's the, the HEL207 is a fibroblast cell line. Um, and they, they, they do other kind of work here to make sure that nothing is a barren tap. And they do a karyotype analysis, which is a very traditional analysis. Um, Actually, I haven't seen a figure with a karyotype analysis in a long time. Uh, it's basically you look at chromosomes under a microscope and you make sure that they've got the right chromosomal number and that they're, they basically, there's nothing, uh, no arms have been switched, so on and so forth. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm going to stop sharing here. Let me just scroll down to figure two. So that's CRISPR reprogramming of LCL cells, and then they move on to um, kind of a, an improved version of this where they target um, the other two promoter regions, the microRNA 302 promoter, which improves reprogramming efficiency. Um, this is again, a schematic of the different guide RNAs that they're, um, that they're using. BP102 uh, you know, is here. Um, that's your, that's your, um, uh, your activator. Um, and here is a transgenic cell line with the OSKM factors. And here's again, alkaline phosphatase colonies per two times 10 to the five cells. CRISPR-A plus E alone, which is the, you know, um, the embryonic um, AL ALU motif region and CRISPR-A with ME, uh, the microRNA and E, and that gave the most efficient response. Um, now the most kind of to me, the most, at least the most interesting from an aging perspective is this cell type here, which is M85. Um, robust effect. And I believe that they mentioned here, the M83 cells are fibroblasts that were originally derived from an 85-year-old donor, <laughs> and this poor guy's claim to fame is that his cells are really tough to redifferentiate. Um, so let's see, where is that mentioned here? Um, yeah, 
CRISPR A plus ME was the only reprogramming conditions condition that properly induced IPSC colonies from an 83 year old male derived primary fibroblast line M83 known for being difficult to reprogram. So, you know, um, I don't know the gentleman's name, but I guess I guess he can tell people this if he's still if he's still alive that I've got the world's most difficult fibroblast to reprogram. Uh, and these oh dear. Have... That's not exactly a, a great claim to fame though, is it, Oliver? I mean, he made, like, it to, hey. he made it to he made it to 83 at least, at least to 83. Mm. <laughs> I mean, especially from a point of view of uh, age reversal rejuvenation technology, it's not it's not exactly the sort of um, characteristic I'd like for my cells. But uh, you know, yeah, hey. yeah, yeah. But they but they but they figured it out in this paper, so they got it. They, they got reprogramming happening, and you know, so if if it can work for this, if it can work for this guy. <laughs> It is interesting, and uh, you know, obviously, there's a lot of money flooding into Chris, uh, not Chris, but into Yamanaka factors at the moment. So I think we're going to start finding out more and more uh, about it and optimize how to reprogram things. I think it's just going to get, it's just going to snowball. To be honest, you know, like Jeff Bezos is backed Altos Labs, um, and they're doing that. David Sinclair's got, I think, it's Metrobiome. Metrobiome. Mm. And um, there are lots of companies now working in this space uh, because it's so promising um, because it does, you know, appear to when you do uh, reprogram the cells, it does appear to reverse a number of hallmarks of aging, not uh, apparently not telomeres, mm. uh, which is a which which is I'm surprised, actually, that telomeres don't re-lengthen uh, after reprogramming. Seems a bit odd, but apparently they don't. Mm. Well, they don't um, consistently do so. Sure we, can, yeah. sure, we can find a workaround to that. Um, yeah, well, we know. I mean, we know. Look, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna say, look, telomerase. We know that telomerase does it. Yes, I know. The usual caveats that every time we mention it uh, is cancer. Yada yada yada. But we've demonstrated. Uh, well, Blasco demonstrated that transient um, inducing of telomerase seems to sort of minimize that risk uh, much the same with yamanakas uh, which uh, when transiently um, done seem to avoid the, the the potential cancer risks i know aubrey's pretty bullish still about telomerase uh, for the cancer uh, reason but uh, i honestly still think that it could still be uh, made to work and i can think we, we we could have a cake and eat it as they say mm -hmm. i don't recall if i can ask you Oliver. When you're talking about telomerase and you know shortening of telomeres, at some point you have this sort of you have these caps on the ends of the genes, right? Yeah. Uh, and and so when it gets shortened to a certain point, the cell will initiate like a self-destruct mechanism, or maybe go into apoptosis, or an essence, yeah. whatever. But so when you lengthen when people talk about lengthening telomeres, are they talking about lengthening the protective end caps? Or are they talking about like you can't, if you start losing actual DNA with important information, yeah. that you really can't replace, right? Because yeah, yeah. it's gone. Yeah. So uh, in this case, which one are we talking about? Are we talking about both or? Well, you're talking, yeah, you're talking about, so be before you get to that critical point where, where, so there's a number of proteins that act as a cap, like you mentioned, um, and they go by different names. I think, uh, I think it's a sheltering complex in mammalian cells. Um, it could be wrong. Uh, but basically they, you know, they, they, they do a number of different functions, but, you know, one of them is essentially to not have the ends recognized as a break. So it's not going to, it's not going to be triggering, um, triggering a DNA damage response, which one of the consequences could be apoptosis, cells die. The other consequences could be that the telomere ends fuse and the cells, um, uh, you know, this, they, they, under mitosis, you have aberrant chromosomal segregation and a whole cascade of other problems that could lead to cancer at that point, right? So that's one way that shortened telomeres could lead to, to lead to cancers um, because things become more mutagenic as a result. Um, but the telomeres themselves, if they, you know, um, if, you, if, you, if you don't have an, uh, telomerase, which is again, another <laughs> like, uh, so that, you know, again, sort of, tying into CRISPR-Cas9. It's totally not, nothing to do with CRISPR-Cas9, but telomerase is an enzyme that carries an RNA. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of enzymes that use RNA as a, as a molecule to 
to basically carry out some function. Um, and in the CRISPR-Cas9 system, the RNA guides it to a location. In telomerase, it's a reverse transcriptase. So basically the RNA acts as its own little template that basically is uh, used. It basically it carries its own primer for, for DNA synthesis. So when the, when the telomerase is, you know, when the telomere ends shrink, telomerase requires, um, requires a, an, an end of DNA to basically attach to. So it can't just attach to, um, you know, there's special, you know, polymerases that, that can do that, but DNA polymerase basically can't just bind to the end and, and synthesize it de novo. It needs a little end to start off with, and that's when the telomerase comes in. Um, and it's an active process. So every time the cells replicate once, things shrink a certain amount because um, just the way um, the lagging strand synthesis works, there's, there's no space for, for these things called Okazaki fragments to bind. And, uh, and it just naturally gets shorter. Um, and that was predicted actually back in the 70s by Olovnikov, um, wrote a paper, and, and I think Jim Watson too, around that time. And, uh, and they said, hey, there's got to be a system in place to, to fix this, right? And that system was telomerase, um, which, which does uh, what you've been mentioning here. And, and, and so the telomerase is, to get back to, to, to your question, it's, it's adding in more repetitive sequences. Um, so those, so every, every species kind of has its kind of unique pattern of repetitive, if, if it uses linear chromosomes, has a unique pattern of these repetitive sequences based on what um, RNA molecule that particular telomerase carries, right? So AAGGTT over and over and over again, right? So because that's, the, that's what it carries. And, and, and that particular repetitive motif is evolved to bind to all those factors that that call are called, you know, cap the ends of the telomeres. And if they get too short, then there's not enough capping factors can't bind anymore because those sequences are 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 missing. And and you might start going into essential genes, but then you also don't have capping factors. So you have three double-stranded breaks as well. And that triggers a whole bunch of other, you know, things that, that can go wrong. you know, to the end, then that sheltering complex can't, can't function. And then it, uh, it all falls apart. And of course, there's also other ways that the, the ends of DNAs can be uh, replicated, which um, was also discovered by um, Carol Greider and Elizabeth Blackburn um, back in the 80s and 90s, I believe, and that's that's the alternative lengthening of telomere mechanisms, which um, some cells, it's, it's not a normal mechanism in mammalian cells. It's like if telomerase is completely off, there are still backup mechanisms that can kick in, um, but they're very rare, and, and it's sort of a very, um, it requires, it, it requires um, uh, essentially um, uh, homologous recombination and, and, a, and another bit of template DNA that's found, found um, uh, upstream of, of chromosomes. But it, um, it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a rare response. So mo most cells that, that shrink their telomeres, they, they just die in culture. Um, and they, you know, uh, so yeah, so that's, uh, so that's how kind of, in a nutshell, that's how telomerase happens. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so so the the fixing has to happen before it, before it gets to that critical point. All right. Um, I don't know any any other questions about. Uh... So yeah, if the Yamanaka factors don't switch on telomerase, there might be some ad additional fact. So so again, just something interesting about this paper here. Um, you know, there's a lot of experiments that still, you know, this, this CRISPR A paper with the plus ES that they added, um, you know, uh, like I said, other than that cell line that was recalcitrant to reprogramming, that seems to work. Um, you know, they didn't look at telomere ends, and they didn't look at telomerase upregulation in this paper, they didn't look at older cells. 
I think it kind of whets the appetites of people that are in aging research and rejuvenation research to see, well, you know, if it's working this well, let's, let's throw this at, let's, and also let's see how this works in situ, right? I mean, we could, we can certainly apply this technology right now in, in elderly mice uh, or other types of mouse models and see, see what sort of reprogramming and how efficient this reprogramming is. So, so there's certainly a lot of room here, right? So, um, so, um, so yeah, they got greater efficiency using a variety of metrics. Um, so again, uh, I'm not going to kind of belabor these points, but you know, they uh, they showed that um, you know CRISPR A plus E versus CRISPR A plus ME. So this is this is their best variation. So let's say CRISPR A plus ME, you know, also gave uh, uh, faster reprogramming by like 24 hours or 48 hours. So this is during reprogramming day 13, day 14, day 15. So these factors, these proteins here, NANOG, TRA160 are just markers of senescence. They get upregulated. Uh, sorry, that's senescence, what am I saying? Huh. Crossing the streams here. Um, stem cell, <laughs> stem cell markers. Um, they go up earlier. Uh, in CRISPR A plus ME, so basically, um, you also get um, better growth cell growth, right? So better cell growth characteristics, um, and you get more uh, more colonies sh showing up when they do this CRISPR A plus ME. And this is in in comparison now to the transgenic cell lines that uh, constitutively express OSKM, right? Um, and much better than 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 the ones that they, uh, you know, than than that don't have uh, both the microRNA and the um, uh, EEA motif. So um, promoter targeting kind of at all those locations improves CRISPR-A reprogramming efficiency. Um, and um, Kind of not going to go through most of this, but basically they're showing that there's a correlation, um, you know, correlation with uh, with certain factors uh, that correlate with stem. So let's take a look at Figure F. Split here, violin plot, episomal vector across different cell programming conditions, uh, expression score of 140 selected um, human embryonic stem cell markers. Uh, let's see, G here. It's the more relevant one. Um, so yeah, so these are these are different uh, expression scores. Basically, correlates to uh, the number of human embryonic stem cell genes that are upregulated. So this the score shift further to the right. Um, you have kind of a tighter correlation. LCL is all the way to the left. Um, so during reprogramming, um, I'm not sure why just the E alone, um, you know, you, you don't have that much, uh, you know, uh, genes correlating with human embryonic stem cells. Transgenic day 15 is up here. So you notice it's kind of spread out and they talk about this bimodal distribution, um, meaning that it's, things aren't quite, um, you know, after uh, 15 days of reprogramming are, and this is passage one, passage 10. So this is after they've been reprogrammed, um, aren't, you know, you still have a lot of cells that are in the not embryonic stem cell um, realm um, versus CRISPR A plus ME day 15. You have less of this bimodal distribution, more of a shift. So um, these are some of the, you know, data points that the authors point to, you know, suggesting that you have kind of a, a um, an earlier, you know, um, switching on of genes. Now, is that going to eventually make them better stem cells? I'm, I'm not sure, but they certainly point to this as, as being an. Uh, earlier, um, and that you can also get these cells, uh, you know, turning on faster using this CRISPR A plus ME. Um, uh, system here. Um, and this is uh, more of the same. So they just, again, mentioned that uh, microRNA 
302 and EA motif acts synergistically to promote pluripotency at the mid three programming stage. So um, kind of without belaboring the point, um, you have a lot of, uh, so these are factors that correlate with stemness. So CD52 is a blood specific factor. So if the cells are going from the lympho, lymphoma state to the non-lymphoma state to the stem cell state, then you basically have lower expression levels of CD52. And that's what you start seeing um, more robustly with CRISPR-A plus ME. And most of the genes that associate with stemness also um, appear uh, in, these, in these cell types uh, that have basically both the, that are targeting the miRNA uh, and the EEA motif. And lastly, um, again, um, CRISPR-A plus ME cells progress to the pluripotent state with improved fidelity. Um, and this is percentage of cells. So D is a uh, cell identity annotation. So they, they're looking at single RNA, I believe. Um, I think they're doing flow cytometry and then counting each cell and then analyzing the RNA and showing which category of genes are being expressed. Um, and uh, you could, this, so, and these are different colors of uh, different kind of um, RNA profiles that fall into different categories. Uh, so down here is ESC, IPSC cells that are, you know, in databases. And most of the cells that are CRISPR-A plus um, the ME, which is the uh, two other loci that are been efficiently reprogrammed. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna stop sharing here. So, um, so basically, all of that data is 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 you know suggesting that you know that this is um, a pretty solid platform to adopt. If, uh, if you want to convert cells, at least the cells that they looked at here, uh, which were fibroblasts and um, lymphoma cells, uh, there's no reason to believe that this won't work in other cell types as well. Certainly that needs to be tested um, and also probably cells from different age categories. Um, but targeting the Yamanaka factors using the CRISPR-A system um, along with these two other loci seems to give the fastest results and the best results um, to date of, of, you know, of converting cells into iPSC cells. Um, and, you know, that's, that's fundamentally it. So if we can, if we can do that, um, then we can basically have, uh, and again, another, another thing to mention here is that getting this into cells is, is a lot, you know, there's a lot less stuff to then, you know, talking about delivery, um, because this delivery matters, especially if we're going to be doing this in situ now, um, you know, a CRISP, various CRISPR systems, people have been trying to, you know, looking, looking at different CRISPR systems, I think CPF1 and other variations. Um, you want to package all this stuff into viruses that can get into a cell or to, a, a, um, you know, maybe some sort of lipid nanoparticle that's targeted. Um, and there's only so much space you can cram stuff in, right? So if you're going to be doing, dealing with Yamanaka factors, um, the traditional way is that you've got all of these genes, you know, um, coded on plasmids, um, and you've got to deliver all of this, all of this information that might not fit in certain viral platforms, right? So, but if you, if you, Is one one entity and a whole bunch of different guide RNAs. Um, so this is basically multiplexing, and those guide RNAs are very short. Um, you know, they're like about seventy bases long, right? So so they don't take up much space. Um, so if you if you have a one plasmid that ba basically makes one Cas9 and seven, eight, nine, ten guide RNAs or more, a dozen, um, you'll form as many you know variations of the Cas9s as there are guide RNAs, so they'll all basically will will match up with the Cas9. The Cas9s are all the same, right? So you can you can compress a lot of more, you know, a lot more stuff in, into into a into a plasmid and 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 have it more efficient 
as you know, more efficiently now delivered into a cell than having you know the entire genes encoded, for example, you know, um, if you want to encode all of the factors, because the factors are being switched on endogenously in the cell. They're already encoded in the genome, so you're just throwing an act activators to switch them on in the endogenous loci. You're not introducing them externally into the cell. So I would think that this also saves a lot of space, especially if you're going to be um, thinking about in situ delivery systems and delivering this into, you know, um, intravenously, for example, um, into a patient, but first most likely into mice to see if, you know, what effect this can ha have on, on particular organs. So I can imagine a whole bunch of experiments coming out of this, um, you know, immediately. Um, you know, you've got the Cas9 system. Of course, you can just directly target it, not specifically to a number of different cell types, but you know, see if you can you can target this system um, and reprogram um, the hematopoietic cells in a mouse, or target certain cells in a particular tissue, um, liver or, or or kidney, and see if you have improved renal function, for example. Um, right on older mice as well, right? See if you have you have certain um, improved functionality in various tissues. Um, so there's you know there's a lot that can be done with this, and uh, and you know I think it's it's just like. Some of the other technologies we've we've discussed, like in the other paper, with the in situ modification of CAR, generation of CAR T cells, um, you know, this is just more arrows in the quiver, you know, for for um, people who um, are in in the longevity sector and the rejuvenation sector. So these are these are kind of uh, now we have we have potential tools that we could use to basically test the theories of what happens if we reprogram these cells in situ, right? Um, people have been saying that for years, but we need a bridge to do that. And, and this is that bridge, essentially. So, so um, yeah, could take some questions, but that's kind of all I have uh, at this point. Wow. Let's just have a look. Well, there was a, a question on Facebook, which uh, Edward uh, Hudgens, Hudgens uh, has asked, uh, are there problems with FDA certification regulations that can slow the update uh, on, and applications of this resort in tech? Now, I mentioned in the chat, the FDA does have uh, RMAT, uh, R-M-A-T, which is a framework, isn't it, to uh, sort of handle these things like gene, uh, gene editing and uh, these more advanced technologies. Uh, but it's like anything, uh, I would say, at the, with all due respect to the FDA, <laughs> uh, it's always going to be slow, isn't it? And especially this sort of uh, cutting edge technology. What do you think, Oliver? We use FDA as a, as a benchmark for, for policy, but that only that, that only applies that only applies to the United States. Am I getting some vacuum cleaner feedback somewhere? Vacuum cleaner. Um, yes, I can hear a vacuum cleaner. Oh dear. I um, think it's my old fashioned hard drive. Um, oh. <laughs> so sorry about that. No problem. It occurs to me that uh, if uh, FDA is slow to approve it, we'll see some offshore clinics offering it because it's such an exciting, powerful technology now. Yeah, so so obviously the FDA is going to take this on a case by case basis, and you know um, they're they're approving gene therapies already. So um, you know uh, I don't think that there's going to be any any exception to this. Um, I think. Uh, you know, I think I think it's it's uh, as usual. Um, the the same kind of usual caveats will apply to everybody here. Is kind of most interested um, in this being applied towards rejuvenation and particularly anti aging. Um, and as usual, nobody's. I don't think the FDA anytime soon is going to approve this. Um, 
you know, uh, for those applications or any, any therapy, right? Because they don't recognize it as a disease, but certainly there, I, I, I can see, I can see this technology being approved for, for many, um, conditions that, um, you know, uh, lead to organ failure, for example. Um, uh, obviously if you're, if you're treating renal failure, then you kind of box it and call it that I'm treating renal failure, not because the the organ is old per se, but that's why it's failing. But you know, you're, you know, it's got its own condition that that medical doctors use, right? Um, of course, the you know the again, this is kind of out of the scope of this conversation here. But if you're if you're treating the other systems of the body are, are degrading as well, right? So, so you're, so if you have an a, improved organ function, then it's depend, it's reliant on all the other systems working. And, and if they're, if they're not, the rest of the cardiovascular system is not, not up to par, then, then that, that rejuvenated um, organ is, is, is basically, you know, working way upstream, you know, the, you know, the, to, to basically maintain homeostasis, right? So, so eventually you're going to have to <clears throat> target everything. Um, so, uh, so I don't know how long, uh, you know, how these, you know, therapies evolve. I don't, I don't know from the FDA's perspective, how long um, that kind of a piecemeal approach can work uh, to, to kind of like dribb dribble out therapies, right? Before you finally just address the elephant in the room and say, "Look, we want to, we need to rejuvenate, rejuvenate everything uh, all at once, right?" And we, we we're not just doing this one disease at a time, but um, but yeah, I think you know they're they're already being approved various gene therapies. CAR T CAR T cell therapy is a gene therapy. It's sort of like the most prevalent one, like the back backdoor gene therapy they kind of call it because. Um, it's been so spectacularly successful in many different types of cancers that they're really kind of going forward with it. Um, so, so yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, short answer is it's going to be a bumpy road ahead, you know, um, with policy and, and, and regulations. Is progeria considered an orphan disease or no? Do you know? Progeria? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think it is. I mean, I think I'm not 100 percent sure the definition of, of orphan diseases, but they're rare. It's 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 got to be a and, and progeria certainly are very rare. So depending on which progeria, certainly Hutchinson Guilford is is astronomically rare. Um, and uh, and then then the other progeria. So there's a lot of uh, that's 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 considered to be an accelerated aging um, illness. Now, how uh, again going back to the now comparison of stem cells to you know you know to human embryonic stem cells to induced pluripotent stem cells, and you do the match and you say, well, it's checked off all these things, so they must be sort of identical or really close to identical or the same thing. Um, I haven't read any paper recently. I I've got to look at the papers that how much overlap there is between, let's say, Hutchinson Guilford progeria, which is basically a, 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 a laminopathy, so lamin aging is mutated, um, and how much of that correlates to run of the mill aging, right? So, you know, the, 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 the normal aging, right? So, um, I'm going to guess that probably a lot because lamin A is kind of like really upstream and you get a lot of genetic aberrations, but how much actually is, you know, how much is there that's, because, um, you know, with, la with, with laminopathy, you, you, could, you could potentially cure it in theory by basically fixing that gene, right? And, but you haven't, you haven't cured aging because our systems are broken down and our lamin A is fine. So there's, there's other things that are downstream of that that are basically um, recapitulating all those morphological entropic changes, right? So, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, that, you know, in, in, in kind of a perverse way, an orphan illness that's a progeria illness might be easier to cure 
um, or treat than aging um, because because you 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 at least know exactly what what the mutant gene is. Yeah. All right. Well, there we are then. Lots we are. Of food for thought. Yeah. So just like with CAR T cell therapy paper, you know, before this, I, I anticipate seeing more papers, more more labs jumping on to these kind of powerful tools, right? And 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 basically pointing them in the direction of rejuvenation therapies and prolongevity therapies, um, because the tools are rapidly being developed. Um, and, and I think uh, it'll be very interesting to see them um, being applied um, as, as viable anti-aging therapeutics. Although I don't think it's gonna be anytime soon for that, for the, for the age reversal thing. I, I, I've said it before, I'm gonna go on record again and say, I think you're going to be looking at least a decade, maybe 20 years before it becomes common. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, it all depends, right? I mean, it all depends. It, uh, I mean, through the normal channels and routes, yes, but you know, um, it, it all, it all really depends on 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 who's who's funding what and. Um, and what sort of what sort of dramatic um, breakthroughs there are, and uh, and and how effective these therapies are, right? I mean, I'm just going to go out on a limb here, right? If if somebody combines several of these therapeutic approaches and shows that this approach, uh, you know, turns a 15 year old dog back into a puppy, it's going to freak people out. Right. I mean, that's like, you can't, you, you know, you can't argue with that. Right. Then, then that's gonna, um, that's going to be pretty, pretty convincing. Um, or, 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 you know, not that I'm advocating this, but buddy who has a birth certificate saying, you know, they were born in 1920 and they look like they're 30 years old. That's going to freak people out too. And, uh, and, you know, that's when I say freak people out, that's basically going to shock people into accepting the reality of, of this working, right? Because, you know, um, you're going to need to see something like that to convince a lot of people, I mean, and, and, and open up massive funds. Um, but you know, in the in the meantime, piecemeal approaches to to targeting diseases of aging are, of course, the viable way to go, um, because there's funding for that already. Um, nobody wants to see anybody die of Alzheimer's disease, right, or or something else that's an age related uh, illness. Um, so so that's that's going to keep that's going to keep chugging along. Uh, but something more radical, you know, uh, an application. Um, I don't know, there might be, you know, it, it might need to, there might need to be a different approach that's taken, but, um, but yeah, that's my, that's my two cents. Um, so, so it all depends. It all depends on, I think, you know, humanity is, is kind of weird like that. Um, I think like going back to the stem cell, uh, stuff, you know, did, did some of these draconian policy, you know, choices that were enacted by previous administrations, give a much needed push to the development of IPSC technology? You know, I don't know. Um, I haven't interviewed Shinya Yamanaka, so I'm not sure. Um, you know, he was working, uh, you know, I, uh, maybe, maybe he's talked about this, right? So, so it's, 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 uh, uh, it's interesting to think about, right? Um, Sometimes, sometimes the motivation comes out of some strange corner and all of a sudden you've got three guys landing or two guys landing on the surface of the moon. Um, 
predict where the impetus to, to get something achieved like that is going to come from. Um, so, uh, but I do think we, you know, with these technologies here, um, theory is turning into into um, into practice. Uh, it's you know we don't longer have to hypothesize like how are we going to get this into a cell and switch that gene on. I mean, we'll probably we'll definitely have improved versions of this, but we can already do this in practice. Maybe not as efficiently as we want to, um, but it's achievable. It's doable. It's not it's not theoretical. Um, it's it's done in the labs all the time, every day, thousands of times a day. Right. So, um, you know. The hurdle is to apply this effectively, safely, and efficiently in humans. But you know, that'll happen. If if my memory serves, I think Yamanaka was more interested in investigating the um, the tadpole research of John Gurdon rather than trying to make an end run around the FDA. Yeah, it could have been. It could have been. It could have been. Uh, it could have been just a historical kind of coincidence, right, with, with how things were happening. But, um, but yeah, yeah. Lessons to be learned maybe from the history of science. Okay, well, um, I don't know if there are no more questions. Steve, I think. I think we're good. I think we're yeah. good. So it's been an interesting one. So, so much for your prediction that it, it's going to be a short one because it's, um, you know, a fairly straightforward thing and you're not going to go too far into it. Well, little did you know that Facebook and our guests here had other ideas because, you know, it, it, as fascinating as the uh, paper itself is, I also find an evidence by people here and on Facebook discussions around it. Um, are also as fascinating yeah, me yeah. personally so you know it's anybody's guess how it's going to roll in the next 10 20 years i just i i say 10 20 years oliver because i i honestly think that there's a lot of blue sky thinking uh but on the other hand there's also a lot of overly pessimistic views as well um in the community it, it's like famine or feast there's no sort of in between <laughs> you know right. that's a little bit more rational it's either oh this will never happen this will never happen in 50 years or 100 years or oh yeah everything's going to be all right because ai and don't worry about it, it it's all sorted i'm like guys guys let's be a little bit more grounded so i'm going to say like 10 years i reckon we probably see some human trials and you know how it rolls 15 20 years if all goes well it'll mm -hmm. uh, it'll start to spread but you know that that's that's my worst case uh, scenario uh i'd like to be wrong i really would so you know honestly that is one case where me being proven wrong would be well i'd be delighted so you know i'm very enthusiastic about uh the cellular reprogramming and um honestly i, th I think things like the hyperfunction theory of aging uh which is jao pedro de Mengais, Sorry if I butchered your name, Joe. Um, I think I got it right, actually. Well, my wife's Portuguese and she's giving me a nod. So I think I've probably pronounced it right. I think his hyperfunction theory of aging, Oliver, which I've talked to you about before, it really does resolve that program versus damage thing. And honestly, if he's right on the money about it, then cellular reprogramming has, uh, well, I'm not going to say huge because I don't want to hype it, but it's got, uh, it's got potential mm -hmm. and even if you don't believe aging is programmatic in some form um it's still got potential all right so, so we've uh, got you there all right so maybe 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 the next paper or the paper afterwards we'll we'll swing back into theory we've been we've been looking at we've been looking at the practical tools uh, where we can achieve uh, um theory you can't just live out in theory land and and you can't just you can't just do practical things without the theory right you need, you need both you need both right you need to yeah you know I, I think there definitely needs to be more uh, or uh, equal focus on fundamental understanding of what aging is 
as well as the experimenting side of things. Um, so I'm kind of sort of waving the old cheerleader pom-poms for, for Pedro here at the moment, who's recently said this. Um, and, you know, you know, he did that critique of the hallmarks of aging. He still teaches his, his students the hallmarks because it's an excellent starting point. But it's very clear that it, it, it isn't a complete uh, picture of what's going on. Um, as are other theories that I'm not going to mention by name because it might upset people. Um, <laughs> John Ferber knows, and um, <laughs> I think you all know what I'm talking about. But I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to invoke the holy name here. But honestly, I think what Pedro's uh, saying about fundamental understanding of aging, I think it's relevant. I think it's important. And why not? Let Let's discuss some of the um, some of the newer theories perhaps in, in an episode like uh, you've got the deleterium, which is uh, Vadim uh, Gladyshev, which is very interesting. You've got uh, Pedro's uh, hyperfunction theory of aging. So, you know, let's have a look at them. I mean, unless it, unless it's so boring that it will all bore you to death. Cause obviously no, that's no, no. We're, I, no. I, that's why we're here. This stuff, we, this, this stuff excites us. We're not bored of this stuff. You know that. I don't think it'll bore John because I remember that massive diagram that he did once of uh, of uh, metabolism. Look, it's just like a huge circuit board. It's just uh... <laughs> it's it's still available online for anybody that wants to download it. <clears throat> I think I have it's it on my wall at home. Actually, it, it's too big for it now. Just realize that that's yours. It's because, too big for uh, a computer screen, but you can print it out as a wall poster. I reckon we're going to have to get it done on a billboard, you know. But uh, we, we need an update, John, because I think like Aubrey it was and other people 20, 15, 20 years ago when it was done, we, uh, we didn't know about the stuff that we didn't know about. And we don't know enough about the things that we don't know about. Oh, some of it. Some of like Aubrey says anyway, we've learned a lot, a lot of things. Maybe we can have a, a 2022 update, John. I think that's that's an excellent idea. And uh, if you want to send in suggestions for things to add in, let me know. Yeah, that could be cool. Um, I'm just wondering whether we could actually, you know, map it on as a an interactive database. But anyway, anyway, I don't want to get Keith too excited because he gets excited about these sorts of things. And then the next thing you know, John, is, oh, OK. Well, would you like us to create an interactive metabolic uh, database for you? Because we've just done it with, um, we've we've just started putting tools on our website. Uh, we've got the ALEC uh, tool for for rodent researchers, which is looking at life expectancy, and that is um, that is one of the tools that we're putting on. And you know, I think we're going to be expanding that. So, John, maybe. You're, John, you're on a committee now. <laughs> I say, John, you've been <laughs> volunteered. Yeah. Keith's gonna, you know, knock on your door in the middle of the night. Come on, let's get it done. But uh, yeah, but seriously, I mean, it, it it could be potentially something to talk about. Cool. Let's talk about theories. All right. So next time, I will I will try to uh, yeah, I'll take a look at the uh, I'll take a look at uh, Pedro Miguelis's paper and see if we do that, or maybe another theory paper. But uh, yeah, let's let's uh, veer towards theory, maybe. And, yeah. uh, and then, then we'll go back to practice. Yeah, maybe get Pedro to come and join us. Yes. I'd enjoy that. I would too. He's, uh, he's, he's very uh, good at what he does. And he's also very funny because he's I, a comedian as well. I didn't so know that. I did, not know, I did not know that about him either until, um, until I was told that he also does stand-up comedy. And it's actually, he's actually pretty funny. So, <laughs> so the more you learn, eh? But yes, uh, he had to fill in some uh, paperwork for his daughter um, a few years back for customs for a citizenship or something. Um, it was just before Brexit. And uh, one of the questions on it was, uh, has your daughter ever been involved in arms dealing or uh, other similar international uh, uh, stuff? And it was like, it was one of the questions anyway. And uh, Jack, Pedro answered with the... Uh, <laughs> yeah he said well it's only the second week of the summer holiday at the moment so who knows what she's going to get up to but uh, not that i'm aware of it's very <laughs> funny he's very funny cool i gotta check out his routine now all right, all right he is funny anyway we'll uh we'll 
if, if you decide that you want to do that, maybe we'll reach out to him and <laughs> see if he wants to join us. Um, yes, that would be, that, that would, eh, yes. Uh, if it's a theory paper, I, I think I would definitely appreciate and uh, having him on or somebody else that's, uh, that he wants to volunteer. Yeah, or David Gems, because David Gems is now built on, on top of that theory. And um, I'm sure he would come and talk about program and quasi-program mm -hmm. and how damage and program are apparently all playing a role in aging, mm -hmm. which kind of makes sense. It's a bit like that old advert, isn't it, with the, the little girl going, why not both? Mm -hmm. I'm sure we've all seen that meme. So, uh, yeah, why not both? Let's, let's dig into it, Oliver. I know, I know that you're strongly in the damage camp. Well, you know, uh, you know, things, things could be, you know, like, like I, like I say, I, that's sort of very qualitative, but, uh, you know, and, and I, I kind of uh, piggyback on what, um, uh, what Leonard Hayflick wrote many years ago in a kind of a very short opinion paper um, back in 2008, where basically, you know, aging derives from physics and longevity derives from biology, right? So you have genetic mechanisms that seek, seek to quell the increase in entropy, which, which in a biological world, uh, but, you know, Throwing in that whole thing with antagonistic pleiotropy, right? If you if you if you if you need to if you need to jack up cortisol levels or do what to essentially you know survive um, to, to procreate, right? Then then you're going to have a trade off. You're going to create damage, greater entropy, you know, and to and 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 I. So that's that's where I see the programming part coming mm -hmm. coming in. And, uh, and, 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 and that's, and that's, uh, and that's totally, totally plausible, uh, evolutionarily plausible. Yeah. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see how uh, Pedro or, or David breaks that down. I suspect it's probably on similar lines. Let's find out. And, um, you know, I think that should make for an interesting thing, but before entropy creeps in further and destroys your internet completely, because you've been having some, I don't know about anybody else here. Oliver's internet's been a little bit wobbly for me here in the UK. So yeah, I've had I've had a little gray bar popping up every like uh, so often, saying your internet connection may be unstable. Well, don't worry, Oliver. You're an open system, but not a closed system. So the second law of thermodynamics is does does not apply. And and uh, you know we 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 can uh, we can fight the forces of entropy, but not today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh yeah we'll leave it at that so thanks for joining us everybody and uh, hopefully we will have a scintillating conversation with potentially a guest next time and uh you know let's uh, let, let's discuss it and uh thanks for the heroes who've joined us uh, today and everybody on facebook uh yeah. the heroes especially without you and your support such shows and the many other things that we do would not be possible and um, if you're interested in supporting us do uh, visit our website at lifespan.io forward slash heroes if you want to learn about uh, joining that and uh, i guess we'll see you next time yeah so take care everybody and happy two tuesday right oh not this again yes <laughs> yes it's rare it's rare all right take care everybody <laughs>